After having received these two letters, Sir Hudson Lowe called upon me, and with reference to the first, he immediately denied having laid any trap for me through the medium of his servant. He, however, admitted that appearances warranted my suspicions. And how could I avoid forming them? Said I to him, this servant had been several times summoned before the authorities of the island after he had been taken from me. Since that, he had good-naturedly come to offer his services for Europe and had assured me that he would find means to come secretly to take my orders. And he had actually come several times, notwithstanding the very severe measures of precaution exercised against us. Be that as it may, Sir Hudson Lowe gave me his word of honor on the subject, and I was obliged to believe him. Sir Hudson Lowe afterwards went on to discuss verbally some passages of my letters, dwelling particularly upon certain expressions which he represented to me in a friendly manner. Could not but be unpleasant to him. He found me not only on this, but on several other occasions of the same nature, perfectly accommodating. My answer to his observations was generally to take up the pen immediately and to erase to modify the expressions that displeased him. I omit a pretty voluminous correspondence upon the same subject. I shall merely state that in general, Sir Hudson Lowe avoided giving a written answer and that his custom was to come as it has just been seen to converse with me respecting the letters he had just received and obtained some erasures after which he retired saying that he would soon give an ample answer. But this he did not do at the time, and he has never done since. But as I have been informed from England, he now pays periodical papers or occasional libelers to abuse the memorial to St. Elaine and revile its author. As in the numerous verbal discussions to which my letters gave rise, Sir Hudson Lowe did not, with the exception of the erasure of a few expressions, obtain any important concession or attain any of the objects he had in view. He would, on leaving me, represent me as a man of deep cunning, and as he affirmed very much to be feared, for with him a man was very cunning, very crafty, and very dangerous, who had sense enough not to yield blindly to all his views or fall into his snares. However, the following is the only trick I ever played him. The idleness and rigor of captivity sharpened the invention. Besides, it was all fair between us. The incontestable right of a prisoner is to endeavor to deceive his jailer. I said at the beginning of this work that the emperor at the moment of our departure for St. Helena had secretly entrusted me with a necklace of diamonds of very considerable value. The habit of wearing it about me for such a length of time had brought me to think no more about it so that it was only after several days of seclusion, and quite by chance, that I thought of it. Closely watched as I was, I could not see any possibility of being able to restore it to the emperor, who had no doubt forgotten it as well as myself. After having thought a great deal on the subject, I contrived to make use of Sir Hudson Lowe himself for that purpose. I requested to be allowed to bid my companions farewell, and wrote the following letter to the Grand Marshal. Sir torn from the midst of you all, left to myself, deprived of all communication, whatever, I have been obliged to found my decisions on my own judgment and my own feelings. I have addressed them officially to Sir Hudson Lowe on the 30th of November in return for the liberty which I am allowed. I abstain from saying a single word about it and rely upon the delicacy of the high authorities to communicate to you the whole of my letter. If any part of it should ever be mentioned or alluded to, I resign myself to my fate. It only remains for me to request you will lay at the Emperor's feet the assurance of my respect, veneration, and affection. My life is still entirely devoted to him. I shall never enjoy any happiness but near his august person. In the unfortunate state of penury to which you are all reduced, I should have most ardently wished to leave behind me some of my wife's diamonds, a necklace, the widow's might, 
But how shall I venture to offer it? I have often made the offer of four thousand louis, which I possess in England at my disposal. That offer I now again renew. My position, whatever it may be, cannot produce any alteration in my intention. I shall henceforward be proud to be in want. What's more, sir, I assure the emperor of my entire devotion to his person, of my fidelity and unshaken constancy. And you, my dear companions of Longwood, let me ever live in your recollection. I know the privations and afflictions to which you are exposed. My heart bleeds for you. With you, I was of little importance. Far from you, you shall know my zeal and my tender solicitude. If they have humanity enough to allow me to exercise them, I embrace you all very affectionately and request you will add for yourself, sir, the assurance of my respect and consideration. P.S. This letter has been ready for you some time. It was written at the time I thought I was going to be removed. Hence, today, the governor, in giving me permission to send it to you, informs me that I am to wait here until answers shall have arrived from England. I shall be for months together at St. Helena, and Longwood will not exist for me, a new species of torment, which I had not thought of. Sir Hudson Lowe, to whom I delivered this letter open, for such was his condition, read it, approved it, and was kind enough to undertake to deliver it himself, a circumstance which had the effect of exciting the emperor's attention and which contributed in a great measure, though indirectly, to cause the deposit to be restored to Napoleon. Seventh through the ninth, the other day I invited the officer on duty to dine with me. In the course of conversation, he told me that he had been a prisoner at Verdun for a long time, but had at last obtained permission to be removed to Paris. Observe the caprice of chance. When he named the person at Paris, through whose medium he had applied, it turned out it was precisely myself who had asked of the Duke de Feltre, that favor which at that time was most difficult to be obtained. Our situation here offers the same uniformity, no appearance of our approaching towards any result whatever. It is now almost a fortnight since the unfortunate event took place, and we are still in the same state of seclusion, exposed to the same restrictions, the same torments. We seldom received any news of the emperor, and then only through the governor himself, our prison was situated, as I have said before, precisely opposite to, and at no great distance from Longwood, from which we were only separated by precipices. Whenever we raised our eyes, we saw before us that object of our thoughts and wishes, and we were forever turning them towards it. We could follow the daily avocations of its inhabitants, which were so familiar to us. We could see every house belonging to it, but we could not possibly distinguish any living object. This constant attraction, constantly opposed, this proximity, and at the same time, this great distance, this object of our wishes forever present, and as it were, ever withdrawn from us. All this together forms something like the hell of the ancients. Sir Hudson Lowe admitted the justice of this observation and had immediately promised on the first day of our confinement that he would soon remove us from this spot. He said we were only there temporarily and until some other more convenient place, which was already in preparation, was ready for us. But weeks had elapsed and no removal took place. Sir Hudson Lowe, who is extremely prompt in adopting a noxious measure, is extremely slow in repealing it. If indeed he ever does repeal it, and which was not the case in the present instance. Yet, I must confess that this governor, since he has had me in his power, has behaved towards me with the utmost politeness and the most marked attention. I have seen him go himself and remove a century which might, he said, have offended my sight to place him behind some trees in order that I might no longer see him. All his views, his real intentions, he assured me, were of the most benevolent kind, and his language was of a nature to convince me of the truth of this assertion, so much so that I have been more than once inclined to doubt the justice of the opinion we had hitherto formed of him. But in the end, I have always been obliged to remain satisfied that Sir Hudson Lowe's actions differed strangely from his words. I have read, for instance, in Mr. O'Meara's work that precisely at this very time, when I thought myself so high in his favor, when I was in some degree reproaching myself with the kind of aversion I entertained for him, he was conveying to Napoleon through the medium of the doctor confessions invented by himself. 
which he declared he had elicited from me by word of mouth, or had under my own hand actuated, no doubt, by the hopes of obtaining in return from Longman some information which he might turn to account. Amongst other things, he said that I had confessed to him that he had not given us any just cause of complaint, but that we had agreed amongst ourselves to misrepresent represent everything to the emperor in order to keep him in a state of exasperation what unworthy means what base resources i might add much more but everything must give way before the following trait which will supersede the necessity of any further instances my son continued to be extremely ill the palpitations he experienced were sometimes so violent that he would suddenly throw himself off his bed to pace the room with rapid strides or come and fall into my arms where he seemed in danger of expiring dr baxter Senior medical officer of the island and an inmate of government house. Came with a degree of politeness of which I preserve the recollection with a sincere feeling of gratitude to add his cares to those of Mr. O'Meara. They both represented to Sir Hudson Lowe the critical state of my son and warmly supported my request that he might be sent to Europe. Dr. O'Meara having, after a fresh crisis, renewed the subject alone, Sir Hudson Lowe put an end to his importunities by the following words which Mr. O'Meara has since repeated to my son and to myself. Well, sir, after all, what matters the death of a child in the case of politics? I abstain from all comments. I hand over the naked phrase to every paternal heart and to all mothers. 10th through the 15th, the governor and his frequent visits, which he almost daily repeated, would often for some motive or other renew his search amongst my various papers. I always assented with the greatest readiness, and so doing, I had at heart to prove to him my complacence and moderation, and for this I certainly obtained some flattering words, but never the smallest act of accommodation. As he was rummaging these parcels, on one occasion, two bundles were left by accident on the outside of the trunk which contained them. I felt a malicious pleasure in returning them to him the next morning. He was much astonished. One would have thought that he would have left them with me, but he locked them up very carefully. And this he said for the sake of strict regularity, although I assured him it was unnecessary. And observed to him laughing that he might well suppose it if it had been of consequence to withdraw any of those papers. He would not have found them in the bundles. I had already had occasion on the first day to point out to him that they had forgotten to seal up my portfolio when it was seized at Longwood. He admitted there that there had been a great irregularity in this respect and expressed that he duly appreciated the circumstances of my mentioning the fact merely in the way of a simple observation. I had indeed no other object than to show him very clearly how incapable I was of taking advantage of every occasion he offered me to quarrel with him. But I repeated, these acts of civility on my part never procured me in return anything from him beyond a few words, not a single act of kindness. A register was made of all letters from my London friends in order to ascertain in the public offices whether any had arrived by indirect modes of conveyance. I had commenced a second letter to Prince Lucian. The governor laid particular stress upon it. It was in vain. I represented to him that it was full of erasures and crowded with pencil notes, almost defaced, that it had not been written and did not therefore exist in reality that I might disown it without scruple, that it was impossible to make any legal or honest use of it. He persisted in having some parts of the letter be copied. God knows for what purpose. He was much puzzled by a note of the Lieutenant Governor's Lady on quitting St. Helena for England. She had told us that the law forbade her taking charge of any letter, but that she would have great pleasure in being useful to us in any other way. I had sent to her for my London friends some objects which had been used by the emperor or had come from himself. A small silver inkstand, I believe some words in his handwriting, perhaps some of his hair, I know not what. These I called precious, precious relics. Mrs. Skelton had replied that she would treat them with all the respect they deserved, but that she must confess to me she had not been able to resist the temptation of taking a small portion of them. Sir Hudson Lowe could not account for my being either unable or unwilling to state what those precious objects were. 
I should be mortified if they should have brought any disagreeable consequence on this lady. I had merely kept the note in memory and a token of respect for her. Mr. and Mrs. Skelton were a moral and virtuous couple whom we had much injured, though undoubtedly against our wish, but their politeness and attention to us had constantly increased with the harm we did them. Our arrival in the island had caused their being dispossessed of Longwood, losing their situation and being sent back to Europe, where they must be without any fortune. At last, after a time, the famous clandestine documents came out in their turn. My letter to Prince Lucian and the one to my London acquaintance. Sir Hudson Lowe had caused them to be carefully recopied, but with many chasms. From not having been able to read all oh, certain words being found effaced upon the satin, owing to the documents having been accidentally wetted since I had parted with them, I carried my complacence and good nature so far as to restore them. And then a sort of interrogatory commands. The governor's attention was much engaged by two points which he had quite at heart to clear up. If, he said, I had no objection to it. The first question was relative to these words in my letter to Prince Lucian. Those who surround us complain bitterly that their letters are falsified in the public papers. It was asked of me who these persons were. The aide de camp held his pen to take down my answers. I desired he would write that seeing no inconvenience in answering, I would do so, but entirely of my own accord. For that, if the governor thought the question by virtue of his authority, I should be silent. And I then said that those words in my letter were vague, general, and without any application whatever, that they were what had been said to us by everyone when they sought to console us for the very improper expressions or descriptions regarding us, which we occasionally found in the London papers under the date of St. Helena. Then I just recollected a particular instance of this in a lady belonging to the camp and known to him who declared openly that she had not written the ridiculous letter which had appeared under her name and that either her friends in England had made alterations in that letter or it had been read in company and perfectly retained and incorrectly sent to the press. The governor's second question applied to my private letter. It contained, among others, a request to ask Lord Holland whether he had received the parcels I had directed to him. Sir Hudson Lowe inquired what those parcels were and by whom I had forwarded them, and here he visibly redoubled the mildness of his deportment in order to obtain a satisfactory answer, confessing that he had no right to compel me to reply, but it would be, he said, the means of materially expediting and simplifying my own affairs. I replied rather in a solemn manner that this point was my secret, which evidently created an impression upon the physiognomy of Sir Hudson Lowe, and my words being taken down as I uttered them, I continued to dictate, adding that the answer I had just given was only that which my education and habits prompted me to give, that any other might have given rise to the governor's doubts, and that it was not proper I should expose the veracity of my words to the smallest suspicion. And after this preliminary statement, however, I had no longer any objection to declare that I never in all my life had any communication with Lord Holland. This unexpected conclusion was a coup de theatre. Quite a comedy scene. It were difficult to describe the surprise of the governor, the astonishment of the officers. The pen stopped in the writer's hand. Sir Hudson Lowe did not hesitate to reply that he fully believed me, but that he must confess he could not understand the business at all. I confessed in my turn that I could not help laughing at the perplexity I caused him, but that I had told him all. The fact is, I had intended when my servant should return to entrust him besides with several authentic documents upon our situation for Lord Holland, but I had not been allowed time in so doing. They had too soon come to take me away. I had the honor of knowing his lordship only by the nobleness and dignity of his public conduct, but to transmit the truth to him as a hereditary legislator of his country and a member of the Supreme Court of Great Britain appeared to me very proper and as both and equally becoming and serviceable to the honor of the British character. The 16th, more than 20 days had elapsed and nothing 
as yet announced any change in our dreadful situation. My son's illness continued to show the most alarming symptoms. My health was visibly wearing away through grief and anxiety. Our confinement was so strict that we had not yet learned a single word from Longwood. I was quite ignorant how my unfortunate affair had been interpreted there. I had merely learned that the emperor had not left his apartment during the last 15 or 18 days and had almost always taken his meals there alone. What did I not suffer from these circumstances? The emperor had evidently been affected, but in what manner should I own it? This doubt was to me a source of absolute torment. It haunted me at every moment since I had quitted Longwood, for the emperor was perfectly ignorant of the cause of my being carried off. Fate had so ordained it. What would he have thought on hearing about my clandestine letters? What would have been his opinions? What motive would he assign in my disguise towards him? I, who from habit would not have stirred a step or hazarded an expression without communicating with him, I coupled these faults, which I even exaggerated with the effect and kindness of the last moments I had passed with him. Some minutes before I was torn away from him, he was more cheerful towards me, seemed to have been better disposed than usual, and some moments later he had perhaps been led to find something mysterious in my conduct. The appearance of the right of reproach and of doubt had perhaps already risen in his mind. This idea grieved me more than I could express in visibly affected my health. Fortunately, the governor came to restore me to life. He presented himself towards evening, appearing much taken up with what he had to tell me, and after a long preamble, which it was difficult for me to understand, he concluded by informing me that he held in his hand a letter which my situation gave him the right to withhold from me, but that he knew how dear to me was the hand that wrote it, how much I valued the sentiments which it expressed, and that he was therefore going to show it to me, notwithstanding the many personal motives he might have for not doing so. It was a letter from the emperor. Whatever harm Sir Hudson Lowe may have done to us, whatever his motives may have been at this moment, I owe him a real obligation for the happiness he afforded me. And when I recollect it, I'm tempted to reproach myself for many details and certain imputations, but I owe them to truth and the considerations of the highest importance. I showed myself so much affected that he appeared to be moved by it. He consented to my request of being allowed to take a copy of what was strictly personal in the letter. My son copied it in a hurry so much we dreaded lest he should alter his mind. And when he left us, we recopied it in many ways and in many places. We even learned it by heart so great was our fear that the night's reflections might occasion Sir Hudson Lowe to repent. And in fact, when he reappeared the next morning, he expressed to me his regret on this subject, and I did not hesitate to offer to return to him the copy I had taken, assuring him that I should not feel the less grateful. We had ensured to ourselves the means of being generous without inconvenience, whether he suspected that such was the case, or whether from a continuation of the same kindness I know not but he did not accept my offer. I shall now lay before the reader that letter, the original of which was kept by Sir Hudson Lowe, which he gave me his word should share the same fate as my other papers, in which I nevertheless had all possible trouble to obtain when the English government, after Napoleon's death, thought they could not avoid restoring my journal to me. I shall transcribe here those passages of the letter which Sir Hudson Lowe allowed me to copy at the time, and as such as they were published after my return to Europe, those parts which he kept back are thrown into the notes. At the bottom of the page, the two together will form the whole of the original. My dear Count, Dillis causes. My heart is deeply affected by what you now experience, torn from me a fortnight ago. You have been ever since closely confined without the possibility of my receiving any news from you or sending you any without having had any communication with any person, either French or English, deprived even of the attendance of a servant of your own choice. Your conduct at St. Helena has been, like the whole of your life, honorable and irreproachable. I have pleasure in giving you this testimony. Your letter to one of your friends in London contains nothing reprehensible. You merely unburden your heart in the bosom of friendship. Your company was necessary to me. 
You are the only one that can read, speak, and understand English. How many nights you have watched over me during my illnesses. However, I advise you, and if necessary, I order you to demand of the governor of this country to send you to the continent. He cannot refuse, since he has no power over you, but by virtue of the act which you have voluntarily signed. It will be a great source of consolation to me to know that you are on your way to more favorite climes. Once in Europe, whether you proceed to England or return home, endeavor to forget the evils which you have been made to suffer and boast of the fidelity which you have shown towards me. And of all the affection I feel for you, if you should someday or other see my wife and son embrace them for me. For the last two years, I've had no news from them, either directly or indirectly. In the meantime, be comforted and console my friends. My body, it is true, is exposed to the hatred of my enemies. They omit nothing that can contribute to satisfy their vengeance. They make me suffer the protracted tortures of a slow death. But providence is too just to allow these sufferings to last much longer. The insalubrity of this dreadful climate, the want of everything that tends to support life will soon, I feel, put an end to my existence. As there is every reason to suppose that you will not be allowed to come and see me before your departure, receive my embrace and the assurance of my friendship. May you be happy. Yours, Napoleon. <laughs>